we're going to be talking about one specific thing. So it's a kind of a once-off sermon, and it's not, um, it's not going to be part of a series. We're going to start a new series next week, which is basically about stress, anxiety, depression, the things that people battle in their minds on an everyday basis, things that people battle in their minds to get the victory over. And we're going to be talking about how the victory of Christ applies in that area and how God has come to, to set us free and the, thing, the mechanisms he puts in place for freedom in those areas. Uh, what is so interesting is that depression is on the rise in every country of the world. And health professions cannot work out what the cause is. We know what the cause is. It's disconnection from your purpose, disconnection from Jesus in, in various ways. But we know, you, you all know someone who's battled with either depression or anxiety or something along those lines. And perhaps you've even battled with it. So this sermon series is for you and for those people. So if you have a neighbor, a friend, a cousin, a sister, a brother who's battled with those things, bring them to this series. I feel like they're going to get great breakthroughs there. Also, if you need to just know how to, how to walk as a Christian in a Christian victory with people of, of this kind, please come along and join us for the series. It will, it will really bless you. And if you know nothing about it and don't really care about it, come anyway, because you will leave knowing Jesus more than you've ever known him before. Amen. So I want to talk to you today about Christus Victor. Can you all turn to your neighbors and say, Christus Victor? <laughs> now you know a little Latin. That is a Latin phrase for Christ victorious. It's an ancient phrase. It's what the early church used to describe what they believed had happened on the cross. Christus Victor. One more time to your neighbor, Christus Victor. <laughs> I see some of you looking awkward. Don't worry. That your neighbor won't bite. We vetted everyone. Lord Jesus, I want to pray that as we, as we speak about this glorious truth, this unassailable victory that is Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that everyone here would leave different. I pray everyone here would feel deep in their innermost being the victory that is theirs, Lord God. I pray for might in our innermost being by your spirit, Lord God. I pray that as we listen to this, something would change in our understanding of God and something would, un would change in our understanding of us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So when I think of Christus Victor, Christ victorious, Christ above everything, Christ, um, Christ having conquered in every, every way, this is what I think of. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? I know, I know you're still thinking about the Chiefs-Pirates game yesterday, but can we cast our minds back to when we all won? Not just some of us. Can we cast our minds back to when we all won? And that is the Rugby World Cup. This picture just, just speaks to me something so magnificent. The thing that speaks to me most is can you see the picture on our president's face? The, the expression on our president's face. I mean, he looks, like, he looks like he won the Rugby World Cup. I mean, he looks like he's just... He's just the most victorious person ever. But, but if you notice how clean his shirt is, can you notice there's not a scratch on him? You know, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't score one try. Not one. <laughs> not one. I mean, he didn't enter into one of those scrums. How does anyone come out of those alive? He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't do one of them. He didn't kick one goal. Nothing. He didn't hold the ball once. Not once. And look at him. Look at him. I mean, he's on top, victorious. It's just amazing. I mean, can we all have that expression every day? It's like, ah, oh, just, I just won. I'm on top of the world. I won the world. I won the world. And then, and then you see the man next to him who actually played, <laughs> who actually was on the field, who felt the ball, who pushed against those, those British lions, who, you know, who, who got his face pushed into the dirt, who, who um, had to, you know, hang on to other guys' hairy legs, who just, you know, he, he did the stuff. He did the stuff. And I want you to note the expression on his face. I mean, he's smiling, but can you, can you see that, that happy exhaustion? I mean, he looks, he looks like, oh, gosh, we did it, but oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, that is over. You know, he's just, I mean, I know he's a, I know he's, he's a fantastic guy and um, we love him, but, but the expression on his face speaks it all to me. 
And, you know, I feel like, I feel like to some degree when we're talking about Christus Victor, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Is that Jesus went out there on the game of life, came down to earth, put on his, his human suit, went into the game. He got into the malls. He got into the rucks. He got into the scrums. He faced the enemy head on. He did it. He got his shirt dirty. He got his, he got his face pushed in the mud. He did it all. He played on, on their rules and he won. He got the ball to the other side every time before they'd even known where the ball was. I mean, he, he won, 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 won more than you can ever imagine. I don't know what the score was, but 20,000 million to zero. You know, he just, he got in there and he made it happen. He made it happen. And then he turned to you and me and he says, here you go. You just won the world. You just won the world. You just won the world. And so every one of us, that's the expression of a Christian who knows what they have. That's the expression of a Christian who knows what was won for them. Knows that despite the fact that we're weak and we don't know uh, enough and we don't always know the answer to the situation, we've won. We've won. We're holding the cup. We're holding the cup because there's a giant, incredible, magnificent God who won it on our behalf. I don't know if you remember where you were when you were watching the World Cup. We did it as a family, and it was great. We were all sitting around in the lounge. We had chips. We had biltong. We had drinks. You know, we were, we were set to cuddle down, huddle down for the next 80 minutes and get it done. And then just 20 minutes, 10 or 20 minutes into the first half, just when we were looking strong, the phone rings, and it's the hospital. And they say to me, Andrew, your husband is ready to be discharged. Ladies and gentlemen, there was some conflict in my heart. There was some conflict. You know, outwardly, outwardly, I kept a smile on my face. Yes, he's out. But inwardly, I'm going, I actually phoned him and said this. I didn't even just do this inwardly. Darling, get your stuff together. Pack everything. Get discharged. Get to the front door. I'm driving past. I'm going to open the door. You jump in and we'll get back here as fast as we can. (laughs) Actually, actually, when I actually got there, it turned out I had to be, you know, I, I kept my smile on and my good wife face, my good wife disposition. And, you know, I had to, uh, don't worry, I had to, I had to do stuff. I had to do stuff. And Andrew and I are still married, so praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. But, you know, that, that, that victory was something that we will live for a long time. You know, even when I when I'm sitting around during the day and I feel kind of um, hopeless or despondent about something, I just bring up this picture. It just makes me feel better. It's like, gosh, we won. We're on top of the world. God can do anything. And I feel today I want to talk about that victory, but on a different scale, that victory, that cosmic victory of Jesus Christ that he handed to you and me, that great, great trophy that you and I hold when we don't deserve it, when we didn't play one game. We are holding something so priceless, so incredible, so victorious. There's a passage in the book of Colossians that talks about Jesus as the victor of all, the victory above all else, the great and incredible victory that that he won. It's in Colossians 2. The whole book of Colossians is about Jesus, really. It's a um, a book about his victory, but starting, sorry, Colossians 1, we're going to start in, and we're starting f- from verse 15. It says this, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his 
cross. Isn't this the most magnificent picture? He's the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? If you want to know anything about God, just look at Jesus. That all the fullness, the power, the word that just spun galaxies into existence, the power that just formed the entire earth, the, the incredible majesty and glory of who God is, is all in Jesus. And it says he's above all. He's above principalities, powers. He's above names. He's above this world. He's, there, there is nothing, there is nothing higher than Jesus. That's what this passage, passage in say, is saying. Not that, that he's above all things, that everything, everything must submit to him. When Jesus walks into a room, everything bows. I don't care who you are, what you are. When Jesus walks into a room, you bow. Not because, not because someone's making you, because, but because he's glory himself. He's preeminent above everything. When he speaks, everything just falls into line. Jesus is above all things. He's magnificent. He has conquered in every way. Conquered in every way. Colossians 2 goes on and says something more. It says, and you, talking about us, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now here's the thing. Jesus is God. What does that mean? It means that he's above all things. He's magnificent, beautiful, incredible. There is nothing that can stand against his will or his desire. He, he is preeminent in everything. But then he stepped down into this world and put a human suit on. And here's the thing. Even at our game, he won. Even at our game, even with the enormous restrictions of humanity, he still won. He still won. And he's preeminent in everything, in his Godhead and in his humanity. In both places, there is no equal. There's, there's not some giant wrestling match between God and the devil. There's not some, some competition. He stands up and everything falls flat. Everything bows. Everything falls prostrate before him. There's, there's not a, a wrestle or a, a, a difficulty or trying to work out who's in charge. No. He's in charge. He's one. He's above all things. I hope you're getting this. And I hope it makes you happy because there's only one who deserves to be in charge. Anyone else in charge, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a disaster. So I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this question, why did Jesus come? Have you ever thought about that? I know there's a very quick answer. He came to set me free from my sins. That's what I was told very often when I was a child by my parents, and of course it's true. But I often began to wonder as I grew up, so, so if Jesus came to set me free from my sins, how did he actually do it? I was told that he died on the cross to save me from my sin, but how, how does something bad happening to this person over here make me okay? You know, it was confusing to me. It was like, how does... Jesus having terrible things happening to him suddenly make it okay for me. I mean, that just doesn't make sense at all. How, how does my sister getting punished for a crime that I committed suddenly make me free of, of guilt? I mean, if, if I went and stole the toy and my sister gets punished, I'm still a thief. So the question just has, has been there for all, for all history. It's not, you, if you've asked yourself those questions, you're not the first. People have been asking these questions for generations. If you've never asked yourself the question, now you're asking. <laughs> I just gave you the question. The eternal question of theo theologians from a long time back. Well, theologians have been wrestling with this, and they have, they have found a number of answers 
This was the first, well, not the first answer. This answer was developed in the Middle Ages, and it is called the moral influence theory. And I'm going to put two up together because they're very similar. They were both developed in the Middle Ages. The moral influence theory and the example theory. The moral influence theory says that Jesus came to show us what true love and righteousness are and therefore influence us toward these. The example theory is Jesus gave us an example of what sacrificial love looks like in order that we would do likewise. The problem with this, these two theories, which sound beautiful, of course, we want to follow Jesus, and when we see what he did for us, it's so lovely and magnificent. Of course, there's something in your heart that wants to be like that. Of course, when we see Jesus' example of sacrificial love, we would say to ourselves, oh my word, I want to be that kind of noble person. Of course, of course, that is a natural, well, it is, it could possibly be a natural response. But here's the thing. We all know people who know what's right and don't do it. Perhaps you are one of those people. No matter what kind of example is put before us, we, we have history to prove to us that even when the Jews had the law and they were told exactly what righteousness looks like, they still couldn't do it. Because the, the point of example or no example, we don't have the internal capacity. Have you noticed that about yourself? How sometimes the very thing you want to do, you end up not doing. Any woman here who's ever started a diet, tell me. <laughs> tell me, knowing what's right, does that help you to do it? Any man here who started an exercise regime, tell me this. Knowing what you're supposed to do, does that help you do it? Because both of these these theories, although they have a lot of merit to them, they don't take into account original sin. They don't take into account the fact that we, we're born broken, that the world is broken. You can't, just, you can't just be a better person and fix it. There's, there's an innate brokenness in the human soul and in the world we, we live in. Just watch the news once. You'll agree with me. So... Later in the Middle Ages, a man by the name of Anselm, say to your neighbor, Anselm. You know, this is what preachers do when they're trying to get response from the, the audience. So if you don't talk to me, I'm going to make you talk to each other. Anselm, Anselm. He was a man, uh, a theologian in the, back in those days, and he developed uh, the prototype of what we as evangelicals mostly talk about when we talk about Jesus. So he, he began that then. Then Calvin picked up this theory much later in the Reformation, and the Reformers carried on this theory, and it became the predominant theory for evangelical churches, which is us. We're, if you didn't know who we are, we are a charismatic evangelical church. And this is called substitutionary atonement. And this is what's so great about this one. It actually tells you why it works. How, how Jesus actually takes our guilt. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sidestep the, the concept of human fallenness. It realizes that humans couldn't just be better by seeing an example of betterness. That they, they, needed, they needed something to change. And that Jesus... Um, Jesus was our substitute, and he took on the effects of our sin. This, the Syrian's original said that Jesus received the punishment we deserved and assuaged the Father's anger, therefore removing our guilt before God. The problem with this theory is that in this form, of course you can preach it in many different forms, but in this form it implies that the Father in his anger, abused his son in order to set you free. And I have shared the gospel with people using this methodology, and they've said this very thing to me. I don't know that I can serve a God that would do that to his own son. They've said to me, I just, I just don't know if that's, that's the kind of God that I, I want to give my life to. And it is the downfall of this theory. If, if spoken just like that, it implies that there was a division in the Godhead and that the father was angry at the son on our behalf. So there's one more theory. 
that also has its problems, but I, I like it. And it's called Christus Victor. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Christ the Victor. And it's actually the oldest explanation of what happened on the cross. It was, it was the earliest church fathers believed this version, and it, it fell into kind of disuse a number of, for a number of years, but has, has been prevalent all the way and is probably now also one of the most prominent understandings of the cross amongst theologians. But Christus Victor says this, God in Jesus came to earth and took the demonic consequences of our sin and so rescued us from bondage. What it says is this. It says that our sin was more than just a personal thing that we did wrong. That, that our sins are a problem, but our sins are a problem for the destruction it causes us and the ones around us. But it's also a problem because it opens a door. It was a doorway for evil. It opened the door for evil to come onto the earth and to begin to influence all of society, to invade nature, to, be, to come and take up residence in our world. And that's why when we look at our world, we don't just see people sinning, we see brokenness. We see a broken world. You look around you, there's, there's poverty where there shouldn't be poverty. There's, there's brokenness in places. The world doesn't work right in many instances, because it was more than our personal sin that was the problem. It was that our personal sin opened the doors for demonic influence, for, for evil, for brokenness to invade our world. And as a result, we live in a broken and fallen world. That's why bad things happen to good people. Because it's not just people that are broken, it's the world that's broken. And Christus Victor said this, that Jesus came down to not only fix people, but to fix the world. To fix the world. And it says, it says that when Jesus hung on the cross, it wasn't the Father punishing him. It was him saying to the principalities and powers of the world, you have access to all these people. They have sold themselves to you. They have given their lives to evil by the choices they have made, by the way they have thought, by the way they have interacted with each other. I am going to, I am going to stand in their stead. Take me instead of them. Take me instead of them. And Jesus was our substitute still, but he was our substitute in a different way. He stood in the place of the demonic rush and hatred that was going to be poured out on mankind because of our sin, and he took it all. He took every abuse. He took every torment. He took every sickness. He took every pain. He took every brokenness. And he hung on that cross, and he took the consequences of our sin. And he said, so that you might be free. It's like a child standing on the road and they shouldn't be there. They're told not to be there. They're standing in the middle of the road and there's a giant truck coming toward them. And Jesus stepped out and stood in front of all of humanity in the world and said, take me instead. This will not hit. And he took what should have been ours. There are some problems so that I, I don't want to leave you thinking that you can ever just use one of these or think one of these because all of them are true and all of them are incomplete. And together they make up a full picture of what actually was done. Christus Victor is glorious and lovely, but sometimes, sometimes it de-emphasizes personal sin. So it looks like, are we just the victims of this giant broken world? No, the truth is we created the giant broken world. So if I want to put that all into one summary, why did Jesus come? God came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son, to show us what true love and righteousness are and to show us what God's sacrificial love looks like. He received the demonic consequences of our sin and in the process defeated the principalities and powers. He removed our guilt by offering himself as the perfect sacrifice and rescued us from bondage, making a way for us to be born again and for the world to be made new. This is a picture of Jesus winning on every front, rescuing us on every front, leaving nothing undone, nothing undone. 
And if I want to say in consequence to that, what is, what is the gospel? What is the good news that we speak to people around you? In its most simple form, it's for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The gospel is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ, lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place. After three days, he was raised from the dead, proving that he is God, offering forgiveness, new life and reconciliation to God, to all who repent and believe. A work so complete, so full. The good news is this. You do not have to live in brokenness any. The good news is this. You do not have to live lonely anymore. You do not have to live afraid anymore. You do not have to live tormented anymore. Listen to me. You do not have to live poor anymore. It's being defeated. It's being defeated. It's good news. So what does Jesus save us from? First of all, Jesus saves us from our sins. Oh, my word, when we talk about sins in church, I can feel people get squirmy on their chairs. You know, it's like, does she know what I did? <laughs> no, I don't know. And Jesus is not, he's not a gossip. He's not telling me about your sins. He's telling me about how great and awesome and incredible you are. But nonetheless, you know. <laughs> you know what's there. But, but the glorious good news is this, that Jesus saves us from our sins. This is such good news. When, when the angel was talking to Joseph, he said this of Jesus, she will bear, I mean, he said this of Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You didn't know you needed to be saved from your sins. Sometimes this world doesn't even know what sins are anymore. Luckily, the Bible doesn't leave us guessing. Paul talks about it in Galatians. He lists some of them. I mean, the list of sins is never-ending. You know what I'm saying? As soon as we've got to the end of that, another human being will invent something else. So the, this, uh, this is a, a good snapshot. And he, start, he talks about the, the acts of the flesh, the, the sins of human nature, sexual immorality, Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife. You know, you'd start, it starts off where, where you could maybe squirm away and say that's someone else, or maybe not. But, you know, by the time you get down to enmity and strife, it's like it's coming home. No, I, don't care, I don't care how you're living, it's coming home. I don't know where you've been and what you've got, it's coming home. And maybe it came home right from the beginning. Don't worry, you took that too. Jealousy, <laughs> fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Oh, my word. He puts envy right next to orgies. You know, it's just like, guys, if you, if you, if you thought you could squirm out of this list, no, you can't. You're in there somewhere. You're in there somewhere. All of us are in there somewhere. Somewhere. But the good news is this. This is what he came to save us from. He saved us from these things. You don't have to live in them anymore. And some of you are thinking, but I want to. None of you. Those other people. Those other people. Those other people. But you know what's interesting about sin? Is that sin is, is not so much like how bad you are. It's more about the fact that you're a human being who has, no, has been created with normal desires. And sin is when you try to meet those, those legitimate desires desires in an illegitimate way. Everyone needs love. If you're going to use sexual immorality to try and get it, 
you're going to destroy yourself. Every, everyone, everyone has a longing for peace inside. Why, why do we have dissensions, fighting, angers? Why? Because we're trying to protect ourselves and create a safe space for ourselves. Everyone needs safety. It's just when you try and get it in a way that's illegitimate, that's the problem. Here, here's the glory of God. Here's the glory of God right after this list in Galatians. Paul lists what you get as fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the gift to you by the Spirit. And guess what it is? It's a list of things that sinners are striving for through their sin. And he's saying that you've been spending so long trying to make your own safety, make your own peace, find joy and excitement and, and, and new experiences. You've been trying to find all these things in ways that is destroying you and the world around you. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'll just give them to you. Yeah, you are. Just have love. Yeah, you are. Just have joy. Just have peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Have it. In other words, he get, the way he saves us from our sins is he takes away the demonic pull of them. And then he says to you, the thing you wanted in the first place, the reason behind you going for that in the first place, I'll just give it to you. You don't have to go there. Just come to me and, and you can have it all. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Some of you didn't know that when you're being tempted by sin, that these are the things you're actually longing for. This is what your heart is craving, but it doesn't know it can get it straight from Jesus. It thinks it can only get it in other places because it has been deceived by the world. It says something so great. It says, against these there is no law. What does that mean? It means there's no end to it. There's nothing that can stop it. In other words, there is always more love that God can give you. There's always more to have. It's like you, you, you've got this insatiable hunger to be loved. Oh, my word, don't worry. He's got more than you could ever ask for. And it will just keep coming. Ask again. Ask again. Ask again. So you, you, you had got peace yesterday. And now you're not feeling peace. Don't worry. Ask again. That against these, there is no law. In other words, ask as much as you want. It just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. Romans 6 verse 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. It's an important point is that sin enslaves you. And Jesus, the victory he won was over those slave masters. Over those slave masters. To set you free. Not only did he save us from our sin, but he saved us from the powers. He saved us from the powers. How many times do people come up to me and say, please pay, pray for me, I'm cursed. Has anyone, anyone ever asked you, you to pray for that? Or... Please, please pray for me. There's witchcraft in my family. How many of you have ever had that kind of prayer or that kind of thought? I've got good news for you. I've got good news for you. He destroyed those things. He defeated them. They don't have the power they say they have. The only power they have now is to lie to you and try to get you to say yes to their schemes. He defeated every principality and power. He defeated every tormenting thought. Those times when you sit there and you battle in your mind to think straight, to know what to do, that anxiety is, is plaguing you or um, thoughts of suicide or hopelessness are, are plaguing you. What is that? That is more than just your problem. It means that there are principalities, powers, demonic entities that are looking to destroy you. But he's defeated them. That's the good news. This is the good news. You don't have to listen to that. You don't have to have it. You just tell it where to go. It is trying to deceive you to think it's not defeated, but it's defeated. I 
you know, there are times when I'll be somewhere and someone, a street person will come to me and, you know, their clothes are torn. They, you can tell they're not entirely in their right mind. And, and I stand there and I think this. You know what? Jesus died that there would be no poor amongst us. Jesus died not just for my sin. He, desired, he, he, he died so that society could be free. What does that mean? It means we don't have to have poverty in our world. You say to me, well, how do we get rid of it? I don't know. Well, I know is that we don't have to have it. And I know that if we work against it, it we will work. Because we, we, God's already won. We already have the World Cup. We don't have to strive and work. It's just we have to move into the victory that was already given us. And last of all, he saved us from infirmity, from sicknesses and, and diseases. Have you ever thought about this? I'll never forget some time back when I was a lot younger and fitter. I used to do, to do something called adventure racing. And what it was was four or five days at a time in the longest one. Some of them were like one or two days. But in this particular one I'm going to talk, it was a four-day one. And... What it meant is you had to travel these far, vast distances out in the, in the bush in, um, in a team where you had nothing but coordinates of places that you had to go. So you had to um, run, uh, trail run, they call it, sometimes canoe, mountain bike, and you just had to get from place to place. Most of the time, you were just miles from civilization. And we were on this particular one, and we... We're running up this particular hill in Swaziland. Beautiful. I remember it to this day. Sun rising, magnificent. Took my foot off the trail, my eyes off the trail for a moment, and stepped on a twig and twisted my ankle. And I remember it. I remember it so well. I literally heard the tendons tear. Guys, it's a horrible sound. It's a horrible sound. And the pain was excruciating. We are, we are miles from anywhere. Miles, miles, miles. Even if, I, even if I wanted medical help, it would have to come by a helicopter and, you know, lower down a rope to get me. I mean, you can't get to those places except on foot. And I'm, I'm there and I'm thinking, and the only way we could get was, was to phone for help. But if you break the seal on your cell phone in these races, you, you're out. They'll come and help you, but then you're out the race. And I knew I've got three teammates and we're so far. I was like, I can't do that to them. So I put on my game face and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not, it's not so bad. Let's keep going. And I'm hobbling and it's, it's agony and it's pain. And I'm like, I've got this stick that I'm trying to work with and, and make it. And as I'm going, I'm thinking this. If the Bible's true, then I have access to a victory already. I don't have to beg and plead with God. I have access to a victory that this was already done. And so we're walking along, and instead of thinking about how painful, I start turning my mind to the victory of Jesus, and I start vic I'm worshiping him. I, I, I sang a few worship songs out loud very badly, and then I, I just started to tell God how great he was, and she just started lifting up Jesus, and I'm going along, and it's painful, and then I notice it's not so painful. And then I notice it's even less painful. And then I notice, oh my word, it's actually working like it should be working. And then I'm noticing, oh my word, it's working exactly this way my other ankle is working. And then I notice, actually, I can run in this. And then I'm nudging my teammates and I'm saying, what are you doing walking so slow? Let's go. <laughs> and there we went and we, we, we didn't finish the race. But that's not because of me. We, we, we had to step out of the race because of someone else. I won't mention their names. You may even know them. But, but I, I, just, I just want this point to be made. That as Christians, sometimes we forget the victory that was won for us. And we live in so much less. We accept poverty. We accept 
a broken mind. We accept dissension in relationships. And yet, there is a victory so great that could be ours if we chose to believe. If we chose to believe. He saved us from our infirmity. What I love about the Bible is that God didn't start healing with Jesus. Did you know that? It says in Exodus 15 that he is the God who heals us. In other words, right from the beginning, God aligned his name to healing. Then... We have a prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 53, verse 5. And it talks about the coming Messiah. And it says of this, he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. Right, right from the hundreds of years before Jesus came, the Bible is prophesying about a Messiah who would come, who would heal us. But what I love about it, it says there in the present tense, by his wounds we are healed. What does that mean? That means that we were already healed. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, you were already healed by his stripes. It means that before the foundation of the world, anyone who stood there and said, there is a Messiah coming who will heal me, that faith would have healed you. It means that faith in a Messiah, past, present, or future, heals you now. It's not something you're waiting for. It's not something you're striving for. It's now, here, now, ready. And some of you are saying, but you don't know. I've been sick forever. We've experienced that. Andrew was sick for 20 years. And every night we went to bed with this thought, maybe we'll wake up tomorrow and he'll be healed. Every day I got out of bed and I said, perhaps this is the day. This is the, this, in fact, I didn't even say perhaps this day. I said, this is the day. And my expectation every day was, this would be the day. And one day we woke up and it was the day. We woke up and it was the day. And he was miraculously healed. And what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, don't settle for anything less than the fullness of the victory that he won for you. If your life doesn't look like healed, delivered, saved, then then press in for that. Do not settle for anything less than that. What did Jesus go on about healing? He said a lot more. When he was asked by an emissary from John the Baptist, are you the Messiah? He sent back a message to him and he said, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. What was he saying? How would you know the Messiah except that I preach good news and that people are healed? This is a sign of the kingdom. This is the sign of who Jesus is. People are healed. Matthew 9 verse 35 tells about Jesus. He went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So what is not happening here is someone coming to Jesus and saying, oh my gosh, you've got migraines. No, listen, I'll heal everything, but I'm not doing migraines. Okay, migraines are out. Oh, What? Your child's dead. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm just not doing that. I'm just not doing that. Sorry. Because when, when you get a physical problem in your body, it feels like, it feels like it comes with a message. Have you noticed that? It comes with a message that says, this is how it will always be. You're stuck here. But the message is every sickness, every disease, every affliction. Jesus has healed that. Not that he's going to. He has. He's already done it. When he sent the 72 out to go and preach the gospel, he said this, heal the sick in the towns that you go to and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. He didn't say, he didn't say pray for the sick. Did you notice that? He didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. Have you ever thought about that? He he didn't say get down, intercede for them. He didn't say take them a nice warm meal, which wouldn't be a problem if you did it. But he just didn't say that. He didn't say help them get their medicine, which wouldn't be a bad thing, but he didn't say that. 
He said, heal the sick. So what, what, what is the prerogative if you stand in front of a sick person? What is the prerogative of the kingdom? What is the nature of the kingdom? What are you holding in your hand? At that moment, you're holding a command from the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who has conquered everything, the one who stands supreme over everything, the Christus Victor, the Lord of all. You're holding a command that says, heal the sick. You're holding a command from the one who every affliction, every sickness was healed. You're holding that in your hand. And his word to you at that moment is not take them some soup, but you may take them some soup. But his first word to you is, heal the sick. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. It's so lovely, so simple, so clean. So beautiful. So what is this great victory that Jesus won on the cross? Why did Jesus come? Who is this Christus victor? This victorious one who has pushed the devil's face into the mud and said, you stay there. Who has ripped apart the powers and the principalities, who's, who's obliterated the commandments that were against you, has stood up and defeated every evil, every sin. Christus Victor, Jesus saves us from our sins. Jesus saves us from the powers, and Jesus saves us from infirmity. Amen.